thank you very much. Um, so thanks uh, to Chatham House and to uh, IASA for inviting me here to make some remarks at this um, launch. I feel a little bit intimidated because this thing's going to be staring at me. <laughs> I, I can actually barely lift it. But um, uh, how many kilos of, uh, of, of energy information would you like, sir? Uh, <laughs> um, I feel like a fishmonger up here. <laughs> but um, what I could do, I, I'm, first of all, I, I'm fascinated, particularly, I think, Naki, you ended on some very interesting figures there. Uh, for the investment figures, so in a sense that's a wonderful segue to the sort of stuff that I can talk about um, with the benefit of some data from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, for those new to what we do, I have a team of about 200 people. Uh, I founded it in 2004, um, built it uh, quite quickly and then sold it to Bloomberg, who has apparently something of a reputation for financial information. Um, and uh, so we, we now have teams that cover the different areas of clean energy, renewables, but also energy efficiency. Um, gas is where we're going. We also have a water service. And so we, we try to cover the, some of the, if you look at the from and the to transition, we try to cover mainly the things that people are going to be doing in the future. Uh, but we're quite crunchy and quite detail orientated because our clients tend to be the investors, the energy companies, the government policy makers, uh, the supply chain that are driving down those experience curves, and they tend to be making decisions today uh, that, that they need information for, so that's what we do. Um, fantastic that you covered the uh, 1.25, the one and a quarter trillion um, dollars currently invested in, um, in energy, because I've never had a figure for that. I've always said it's somewhere between one and one and a half trillion, depending on your definition. So now I'm going to say it's 1.25 exactly, and that's Naki's <laughs> definition. Um, and to, to put that in perspective, in clean energy, so energy efficiency, renewable energy, carbon capture and storage, the stuff that we track, we've got a figure of 250 billion. I don't want to do dueling numbers, um, but that includes the R&D piece and the projects, et cetera, et cetera. But we count that. I have a team in South Africa counting project by project, and that's the 2011 figure. It was 280 uh, billion. What it means is that over the last seven years, there's actually been a trillion dollars spent on what we'd call clean energy, um, sustainable energy. And I think that's, also, that's always an important uh, point, that if anybody still calls it alternative energy, then hit them with the trillion dollar figure and move them on, because it's not alternative. It is actually a mainstream part of the energy mix. And we see Germany, 25% renewable energy, uh, large proportion of Texas, 9% wind, you know, very big numbers now, nothing alternative. Um, so 250 billion, um, my sense, I, I'm interested that you're more optimistic there and after doing this work, you say that we need to get from, we need to get to about 400 billion from 200 to 250. I think that the challenge, I think we're a bit further away. Um, maybe it's different definitions of, of the, what goes into those numbers. My sense is if we get from about 280 billion to something like 750 billion a year, um, so something like a tripling rather than a doubling, then I think we're over the hump and we'll start to see emissions and also other uh, externality costs of, of, the, of, of fossil fuels reducing, but I would like to see a tripling, not just a doubling. Um, sadly, I can update you um, on where it's going this year, which is we're likely to see the outcome this year being 250 billion versus 280 billion last year. So I think that's an 11% uh, decline. Lots of reasons for that. Um, cheap shale gas in America, uh, lots of political instability and uncertainty in the US, not knowing who would win the election, and uh, the expiry of certain uh, production tax credits for wind. In Europe, of course, the ongoing festering financial fiscal situation, which has sucked so much air out of government's ability to support uh, the transition that Naki has been talking about. So we're going to come in for the first time since I've been doing this, at a lower global investment figure, considerably lower, 10%. Um, there are some, there are some uh, countries that are doing better than that, of course. Uh, and one of the themes that we've noticed um, is that we see investment increasing in South Africa, Brazil, Mexico. Uh, China, it, it really surged, but actually has now plateaued. Um, 
but also India, last year, the fastest growing market for investment in clean energy of the major markets, sadly having a difficult year this year, they've changed some policies around wind. But there's definitely a diversification going on, where if you go back to the year 2002, 2003, clean energy was essentially a European business. Um, and then, it, then the US takes off, and then Asia, China. Uh, but now we're seeing these the sort of infill of other markets that could be really quite substantial. Uh, lots of talk now about Saudi Arabia finally having uh, understood and following the drops in cost of solar that actually they shouldn't be burning oil, they should be using solar to drive their huge and increasing air conditioning demand, uh, uh, and that would actually be economically as well as um, geopolitically and environmentally uh, a good idea. So we see these markets coming along that could be very substantial, but they're going to find it hard to make up for weakness in the US and European markets. And obviously Japan in its own situation also looks like being a growth market uh, post Fukushima. Um, some problem areas, and the, the title and the topic here is energy access, and of course most of that money that has been flowing has been flowing in uh, the OECD, that was 54% of the 2011 figures, and the basic countries 41%, so uh, the big rapidly growing but essentially already electrified economies that Naki spoke about of uh, China, India, Brazil, well India being not fully electrified but uh, the basic countries 41 percent, rest of world the slower moving developing world only five percent of the money flowing there and that's one of the big issues uh, is that they're very underrepresented relative to where they need to be going. We've just published, uh, to coincide with uh, the talks down in Doha, the talks about the Green Climate Fund, an analysis of cross-border flows to see to what extent that 280 billion uh, is made up of flows from north to south, or is it north-north, and I can share that with you. Um, about 25% of those flows, of that 280 billion, uh, or the, the asset piece of it, the building the projects and so on, um, about 25% is cross-border, but the majority of that is north-north. It's Europeans investing in the US and Americans investing in Europe, uh, and now a little bit more maybe in Japan and so on. Um, there's some south-south, cross-border south-south, not just China-China, Brazil-Brazil, but also uh, uh, investment flows uh, that are going across the borders in the south, um, some of it in Latin America, some of it in Asia, uh, and that is about four billion. Um, a little bit of South North, some Indian, some Chinese investing in, in Europe, but very small. And then the one that everybody wants to know about, because we have a triangulation point from Copenhagen of 100 billion, the number is eight, 7.9 to be precise. So there's 7.9 billion flowing north-south in clean energy today. Now, clean energy isn't all of climate. There's forestry, there's land use, there's all sorts of other bits and pieces, and of course, the very important one, adaptation. Um, but clean energy is probably going to be 60, 70% of the whole. Um, so your 8 billion is definitely uh, a, an order of magnitude below where it needs to be. And you could argue a couple of orders of magnitude um, too small. Um, Within that, again, coming back, trying to stick as close as I can to the theme of energy access, there's other analysis um, that is from, from, from other, not our own um, that shows that about $5 billion a year is being spent on energy access specifically, and that to get to the targets um, of, of uh, 2030, universal energy, uh, sustainable energy for all, and access for all most particularly, that probably is out by a, a, an order of 8 to 10 a much more radical uh, uh, growth needed there. So there's some metrics that I think you can pull out of all of this, that overall we need to double or triple what we're doing, um, and then uh, down to the energy access where we need to multiply our efforts by factors of 8 and 10. So very, very substantial challenges. Um, some of the things you, uh, like you mentioned, sustainable energy for all, uh, and that's something that we've both been involved in, uh, but I've also mentioned um, Doha. So one of the big challenges is, if you like, overall, how are we going to spur this acceleration? Is it going to be top-down, everybody gets together and says, it is finally time, let's do this deal? We're at COP18, there's a clue there. 
Um, or where I'm optimistic, I come back to the trillion dollars that has been invested over the last seven years, the quarter of a trillion a year, so the next trillion will be four years or less and then maybe even accelerating therefrom. Um, and so these, these uh, more, if you like, voluntary or bottom-up or pledged responses seem to me to be much, much more produ uh, productive. Um, and so uh, there's a question, perhaps we'll get some feedback in the remarks, about whether if we simply said, let's do more of the things that have got us a, a third to a half of the way there and stop worrying about and investing credibility and effort into the top-down uh, efforts, would we be moving faster? Um, interesting question. Um, we don't have to answer it. You could say, well, let's do both. I think we lose credibility, but that's not, you know, I'm not that important. What I do know is that sustainable energy uh, for all is a fabulous multi, uh, multilateral platform that has definitely moved things forwards. Clean energy ministerial, multilateral platform that has moved things forwards. Uh, and there are others. There are bilateral platforms, US-China, CCS partnership. There's uh, a, a Holland-Indonesia bilateral partnership. There's UK-India. And then you can move to the national to the, or to the regional blocks, the stuff the EU is doing, the stuff that individual countries are doing, uh, and then down to cities, C40, all the way down to municipalities. And I know one in Switzerland that has got together and is going to become Switzerland's most renewable energy village uh, because of some initiatives um, that actually one of our audience members has taken at that level. And you've also got sectoral deals and sectoral approaches. So uh, my sense is that that sort of, uh, if you like, a fractal response at all levels is probably going to be uh, most productive. Nevertheless, there are some very, very considerable uh, barriers. Um, and in terms of the developing world and energy access, there are barriers in terms of um, just the overall investability of some of these economies. We notice Bloomberg very definitely that the places where clean energy investment is happening tends to be places where overall investment is happening. They are just countries that have got better climates, better governance, and if possible, local capital formation, local capital markets, local debt providers, because nothing reinsures an investor quite as much as saying, well, the brother, the brother of the governor of the central bank is putting his own money in, uh, or, 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 or words to that effect. And that's you know, how some of this stuff uh, you know, has to happen. Forex risk, huge problem. As long as you need um, equipment from overseas, but your revenues, electricity that you sell, is going to be in the local currency, you've got Forex exposure, you get into the realms of export finance, everybody's doing it, China's doing it, Europe, China's probably doing it more, US. But nevertheless, there's a residual forex risk, which is enormously difficult to manage. Um, and then issues around uh, the fact that most of the tools we've developed to deal with the barriers, those barriers, are fine for projects. They, they work at the large scale. You can get the World Bank involved. You can do some of the uh, mitigation uh, using uh, MIGA for foreign exchange uh, risk, or some, you can get some policy insurance of various sorts, uh, or you've got a big enough project so that the, um, the, the, the country's leaders are going to have some uh, skin in the game to make sure it happens. The problem is, as Naki showed on those charts, a lot of what has to happen is actually going to be distributed. We need to do central solutions and distributed solutions. It's not either or. And a lot of the tools that we've got at our disposal simply are not designed to spur distributed solutions. Solar rooftops, biodigesters, energy efficiency uh, at the village level, at the, at the small city level, and so on. And so that's a huge, huge um, challenge. Um, I think that the risk, because of those barriers, where we are is there's a risk that, first of all, a bunch of stuff um, doesn't happen, doesn't happen before 2030. That's a very considerable risk. I'd like to be optimistic, um, but it's difficult. Um, and then uh, the other risk, the alternative risk, or a, a corollary, is that what happens is that the private sector finds it much easier to do some things they understand much better essentially building dirty infrastructure, building fossil fuel, um, uh, the, uh, enabling a drive towards personal transportation, all sorts of, uh, of uh, easy investments that are well understood. And that then leaves the public sector to kind of remediate and clean up 
and try and fill the gaps in financing. And I finally cycle back to this because the solution to that has to be systems approaches. We're not going to do this by saying we've got a world which is barreling off in a direction that we don't like. So let's try and spur a little bit of investment and, and try and, uh, 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 with, with heavy intervention in pricing, heavy intervention in capital allocation and capital provision, and try and overlay and correct the problems. We're actually going to have to bring those two back together with some sort of a systems approach. My sense is it's going to involve energy, it's going to, at the heart, as you pointed out, it's going to involve water, it's going to involve uh, the whole sort of bio-based economy, it's going to involve reducing food loss, which you didn't mention, but I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'll find somewhere in, these, um, in, in, in that document there, um, and so on. So I, I really think this is an important um, stage in developing our understanding of solving all of those problems. The finance community has the funds, but it's not at this point um, going to be, uh, it's, not, it's not deploying them at the right scale. Thank you.